Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, we would like to um, come over to um, next event, which is actually the closing event of Ukrainian program on uh, Frankfurter Buchmesse of the program uh, Fragility of Freedom. And I would like uh, to tell right away that uh, we have here a mistake on the monitor. You see two people and we are three. We have to be three here. I will uh, present the speakers right now so that you know with whom uh, you are speaking. And uh, we are also thankful to Goethe Institute Ukraine for the support of this whole program, which was going on a few days here on the uh, book forum. And uh, we are now also happy to close it and to speak about uh, forms of presence. And um, this um, discussion or this sharing talk uh, is uh, also about um, how culture and arts and education can be present in these times when the resources are not enough and which creative forms they are finding in this way. Uh, and for that, I have, I think, two best speakers which could be there in order to speak about that. Uh, Olesia Ostrovska-Luta, who is a general director of Mestetsky Arsenal. Mestetsky Arsenal is an art museum complex uh, and one of the most important cultural institutions in Ukraine. We will come to it. And it's also uh, Anna Novosad, who used to be Minister of Education and Science in Ukraine in 2019. 20, and now she's co-founder and strategic director of a newly created foundation, Safe Ed, and we will be also speaking about this foundation. And I would probably start with this, if you're okay, Anna. Yeah, like um, Safe Ed um, is a foundation which is dealing with um, very important, urgent issues which education is having. For example, you are having, uh, you are helping to construct the damaged schools, also damaged schools in many regions, also in Mykolaiv and in Kharkiv. Uh, you are helping uh, to arrange bomb shelters in schools, but you are also uh, working together with schools on new strategies of education and new strategies of curriculum, how, how educational process can be going on. And what I have seen, you could fundraise so far around 5 million euros. It's probably more right now, but like, yeah. And uh, could you also tell us like about these strategies, which strategies are you using in this context where the resources are not enough for other things and probably education is unfortunately not the highest priority priority and which strategies do you found, uh, find and which strategies also for collaboration do you find in this process? Thank you very much, Alona, and I'm happy to be here at this closing event. Um, I think I would start with, uh, well, by now, very unfortunately trivial uh, and, and obvious thing. However, I think it's always important to, to stress that, that Russia is... Uh, having this war not uh, only against Ukrainian military, but it's having uh, the war against the entire Ukrainian nation and uh, it having the war uh, against every basically sphere and sector of our life. And uh, unfortunately, education is one of the biggest victims uh, of this um, Aggression that uh, hasn't started in 2022 or 2014. It has started more than 300 years ago when Russians first uh, occupied uh, parts of back then Ukrainian <clears throat> uh, territories and started to basically destroy and demolish the Ukrainian identity also through culture and education. Uh, by now, Russia has... Um, very intentionally, deliberately, and cynically, and also very strategically destroyed every tenth uh, school in Ukraine. So before the big war, we had uh, roughly 15,000 schools. By now, uh, 1,500, so 1,500 are gone uh, completely, and uh, hundreds and hundreds are um are seriously damaged, and that's only general secondary schools. I'm not even counting kindergarten, so on and so forth. So uh, they do it uh, very deliberately. You can see that they target civilian infrastructure schools not only when there are or there there is a basically um, I don't know a potential presence of Ukrainian military. They do it all over Ukraine, uh, and also in uh, in instances when there are basically just civilians. We had that experience. Uh, last August when Russian Iranian Iranian Russian drone hit a school in Suma region it's 200 kilometers from the border it's really far and they hit it with a drone then four people died 
there were no military. These were just civilian people preparing for the for the September. So uh, this attack is very uh, intentional. Uh, on the other hand, um, for us, uh, for Ukrainians, those who stayed in Ukraine and also those who returned, because people, well, especially women with kids, are returning also uh, in quite big numbers. And I see that in many, many cities and towns and villages where we uh, work as the foundation. Um, and thus, education is, is becoming an essential service. And oftentimes, it's, a, it's one of those um, reasons and arguments and factors when women decide, okay, we return from Poland or Germany or any other country to Ukraine or, or not, is there kindergarten or school? And thus it's 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 critical in many senses to have hospital, school, uh, and you know, like basic basic normality of uh, of living. So what we do, uh, is, is is trying to somehow uh, remedy the situation with quick access, uh, quick emergency measures that could uh, secure access uh, to education. Of course, with this huge scale of destruction, it's it's impossible, and I I really doubt that ever will be possible to get back all the schools that we that we had. Uh, but for me, it's less about the buildings right now; it's more about the the, the access to any educational activities. So what we do um, are the few things. So first we do temporary schools. These are either modular solutions or repurposed buildings, parts of hospitals, uh, community centers, um, hotels or restaurants, even in some cases that we agree with the local authorities and repurpose into school and completely rehabilitate them. These are schools in the bomb shelters and arranged bomb shelters uh, in many locations, especially around the border in the north and also uh, massively in Mukhlaia region. The only way you can study gather together is underground and uh, if we have to spend so much time underground it has to be a safe not only safe but also a welcoming space to the extent possible and the third thing that we do it's it's been our invention our so-called digital learning centers these are basically like smaller learning spaces that we completely arrange with everything that is needed from the rehabilitated space to procure devices and um engage tutors to work uh, with children. And this is especially critical to uh, liberated areas where Russians usually steal everything, where, where the educational process is completely disrupted. Um, yeah, so in a nutshell, those are a few things that, that we do. But also, as you mentioned, what, what we try to do is, uh, you know, before the big war, Ukraine, well, it was clumsy, it was, <laughs> it was hard, but we did a lot of reforms. And education reform once was one of the most systemic. And so uh, for us, it's also critical to somehow try to keep that pace of the reform, at least in those territories where that is by now possible. And who are your partners when you're working on Safe Ed? Because I have seen on the website, like there could be any person. You can basically yeah. donate to any of the projects, but probably you also could get some bigger partners on the board. Yeah, well... We, we try to be ethical and uh, everyone understands that every Ukrainian right now uh, has to donate and donates to the Ukrainian army. Um, and so we, we cannot go and fundraise huge funds in the society. We think that uh, perhaps that would be a, a task after the big war uh, is over and people will have more time and resources and attention to, to other sectors. But by now we predominantly work with more international partners from European Commission to UNICEF, various, um, uh, you know, less known organizations from Denmark, Germany. Uh, Germany is actually, uh, there is a uh, organization called AVO and, uh, they are our great partners in Chernihiv region. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes in Ukraine, uh, partners are more prone to come to Bucha, to Irpin, to those places that are well known for this huge tragedy. Unfortunately, this tragedy is in so many other villages and towns. Um, and uh, I'm grateful, to, for instance, in this sense, to, to German partners who... Uh, agreed to to work in in those very very far remote areas next to the border with Belarus, for instance, and that is really critical. So thanks to German partnership, we managed to arrange a couple of huge learning spaces in the bomb shelters, uh, and those were first uh, uh, opportunities for the local kids uh, in a in a year time to get back together uh, in person. So yeah, yeah, thank you. 
Um, Olesa, uh, as I said, Mestetsky Arsenal is one of the most important cultural institutions in Ukraine. And I can say that many people were looking up also and looking what Mestetsky Arsenal and some other bigger institution will do or not do in Ukraine. And for example, it was an important for me and for, for many other people, an important symbol that, for example, Book Arsenal was continuing. It was founded in uh, 2011. Uh, uh, Yulia Kozlovets, who is uh, one of the curators of it, he, she was uh, here on the panel, on the previous panel. And um, it was one of the signs of hope also for the community. So it's possible to make a book festival uh, during the full-scale invasion. And um, how could you also frame it? Uh, which collaborations, which other projects could you also make uh, happen in these times when the resources are not enough and, and when the security is under big question? Okay, thank you for this question. And I'm also happy to be here and to closing the program with this event. And uh, let me start with the second question. And then I will move on to the book arsenal. And the second question is, what other festivals or projects we are doing um, in this situation, in the situation of war. And here I must say that I am full of respect and admiration to what Anna and her team is doing and how safe it is helping to restore the very process of education where it is under attack. Um, I think this is very, very crucial and one of the largest uh, issues and challenges we as a society face apart from the military invasion and that is losing of educational potential and which means losing uh, of future pr prospect uh, prospects for a whole generation perhaps and um, this is something which is hard to comprehend but we are used to thinking of ourselves of ukrainians as an education educated society with 100 percent literacy but we might lose it in the war um, and we at the art arsenal also asked ourselves was what what's our role uh, in uh, um, helping to um, to avoid the, the, the worst case scenario. How do we serve our community and our children so that they get a chance for education? And as Anna said, they often say that, uh, often works with um, other institutions, uh, often of cultural, from the cultural part of cultural infrastructure to ensure that there is some resource for children to um, get educated. Uh, this is the way we think about ourselves as well as an institution. How do we help to bridge the educational gaps? How can we as a cultural institution be instrumental in that? And this is one of the reasons why we thought it's crucial to organize another event, and that's an annual festival. It's a children's festival, which we used to have before the invasion. And we didn't organize it uh, last year offline. However, uh, our educational team had uh, uh, capped a project called... Uh, uh, called um, it's it's an essay. It's hard to translate because there is a word play, and I'm trying a little bit to translate that. These are essays uh, in Ukrainian. It's called antitvir, anti essays. Um, it's a creative uh, writing competition. It used to be a competition before the war, but in 2014, uh, teenagers, 2022, competition sounded like an unnecessary. Uh, stress. You don't need competition in in a situation when half of the country is displaced, displaced, and your children uh, need support, and not um, they do, do not need to compete with each other in this situation. So, so, our educational department organized not a competition, but rather a program for teenagers to contribute their essays uh, with the uh, focused on the topic of the book Arsenal, which never happened. Book Arsenal 2022 was supposed to have a uh, to have a topic theme, as we call it, um, and it was called the great um, the, the great movement of the people. Uh, 
And we just were thinking about resettling, finding new new places to live, new ways of uh, new lifestyles. But suddenly it was um, in a very tragic way, very relevant to the experience of every Ukrainian. So we asked teenagers to uh, contribute their essays focused on that subject. And the my co colleagues the, the received an overwhelming amount of really great pieces of writing, where children were writing about their experience. So there were also workshops organized for them, and those essays were all of them were published, and a part of them were translated in English and published as well. There was one thing that we tried to do, and it was May 2022, uh, the very beginning of the invasion. And then we continued that this year in the festival called um, Neo Educational. Uh, there is an, uh, again a word play in Ukrainian. It's Neo Svitny Arsenal, and this is both non-educational in and neo educational in one one word arsenal. And it's a festival for kids where all sorts of cultural institutions present their educational programs where kids learn through play and pleasure. And um, I think it was one of the most inspiring and cheerful uh, events this year where you had so many children uh, learning and playing because um, what do you do as a child in the war zone? You still have your life. You still have to uh, to be learning. You still have to um, to get some education. You still have to live your best life. Or whatever the uh, whatever the uh, circumstances, and that's how we, we as an institution are trying to bridge what is not there um, in a more formal um, institutional way. And shall I speak about the book arsenal now, or maybe later? <laughs> okay, the book arsenal is um, our largest annual project and that, that's a book festival uh, it's both a fair and a literature festival and we had a question we asked ourselves whether we should do it in 2023 one reason why it's such a question is that many publishers are in different situations some had to evacuate their teams and their books some were situated in Kharkiv, and Kharkiv is a city on the northern border of, of Ukraine, which means that Russian artillery gets into the city, so they are under constant bombardment, and working in Kharkiv is extremely hard, so much has changed there too. But there are also other uh, Western Ukrainian cities that are not affected to the same extent. So the, pub, the situation of individual publishers is complex. It's one thing. Another thing is that you cannot have the same, the same scale of a festival, even in Kiev today, just because it's dangerous. We uh, we get uh, missile attacks uh, on daily basis, and what do you do when you have a few thousand, uh, let's say five to ten thousand people in one place? It's a great risk. So uh, on the other hand, as, I, as I've said, everyone, each of us lives our best lives here and now, even uh, in war situation. And we as human beings need places and events such as festivals to be together. It's absolutely crucial for humans to come together to think about their own experience, to have a place to speak about what they are going through, to cry and to laugh, we've been laughing so much all that festival, and to hug. I don't know if you've noticed, all the Ukrainians hug all the time. And that's a new habit. It didn't. It was not like that a couple of years ago. But you need that space of hugging, of being together, of having common jokes, of being able to cry together as well, of being able to kind of digest your own experience, and that's a festival. So we thought it's crucial to have it this year. But we had to reduce it in scale. It's It was more or less one third of, a, of the usual scale. And honestly, I must tell you that as, as, as an organizer, um, I only, uh, my, of my, my primary wish was, please, 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 no missile attacks today. <laughs> it's 
all you are thinking about. And just to give you a vivid picture of that, uh, it's it was June. And in June in Kiev, you might have heavy rains. So there was a sto storm and rain uh, outside. And everyone... And Mestetsky Arsenal has also an extensive yard where many people gather, um, not just inside. So rain started and everyone got in. And at that point, I, and to, to get to, to, to a shelter, to a bomb shelter, you have to get out. And it takes you about seven minutes outside, walking outside to get to the shelter. And my only pray was no missile strikes now, please, because people cannot go out in the storm uh, to get to the, sh to, to the shelter. So that's one of the burdens you have as, a, as an organization um, doing a festival. On the other hand, because you have this, this burden on one hand, and then you have this need on another hand. And there you decide what overweights and what decision is made. I'm blessed to have, believe me, a brilliant team. So it was easier to decide with that. Yeah, when you were speaking about the storm, um, uh, I was uh, remembering the other sense. I'm I'm living in the western part of Ukraine where there are like less uh, air raid alarms and attacks, but still, each time when there is a storm and thunder, we get a message from our mayor telling people it's only a thunder. It's 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 not a missile attack or something like that. I could imagine it also. And uh, Lisa, you must have had like really a lot of work with security because aside. Uh, of uh, danger of missile attacks. Uh, you had current president on the book forum. You had former president on book forum. You had probably some other former presidents on book forum. You have you had like a lot of different guests there. Yes, that's true. And um, I'm happy to admit that um, Art Arsenal is the place and books, um, uh, Book Arsenal especially, is the place where uh, politicians also come and uh, both current and former politician. Anna, I think, was also there as, as a politician. Um, uh, as a, oh, I hope future too politician in um, at the um, at the book uh, arsenal and just to give you a small um, human touch and a joke when before the president uh, visited book arsenal of course there were heavy security measures with all sorts of checks because we are in the war and uh, imagine a wartime president inside of the crowd of people and i think it's very very brave and courageous to do uh, that, so they, uh, but but before that visit, there were uh, many many security checks, and we had a joke with together with, with my colleague Yulia, who's here now, that we couldn't have afforded it ourselves. So so it was uh, uh, actually a nice donation to the book arsenal. Thank you. Uh, we are actually a cozy group here, but anytime you have questions, I will ask you from time to time, like, please raise your hand and you can also ask questions. Are there any questions from the group? Um, then I will uh, put a question about politicians because like, uh, yeah, uh, I actually I wanted to do it. Yeah. Um, Ukraine is known as a country uh, with a very uh, strong civil society and also with uh, actors of civil society who can take partially also the function of state or what the state is not doing or like does not manage to do. And Anna, you've been a minister of uh, science and education. Olesa, you've been called to like in this list of people who were nominated uh, for the Minister of Culture on, on some moment, like a few months ago. I would like to ask you, as people who are uh, working with this bigger project, um, what is your opinion um, about um, Ministry of Education in Ukraine? How is dealing with the current issues and about the Ministry of Culture in Ukraine, how it's dealing with the issues? Is it dealing uh, with the current issues the same in the same creative way, I don't know, easy way that you are doing or it's happening somehow differently? It's your personal opinion yeah. on that. Well, first of all, um, I think it's it's in our very, very kind of going backwards history to have a very vibrant, well, if not civil society, then very horizontally organized uh, society, horizontally organized groups of activists. And this is something that was 
helping us along the centuries. Uh, but what, what was also our curse, because <laughs> I think we do great revolutions, uh, really powerful, successful, uh, but then we have um, a bit of challenge and the problem being more, you know, nerdy and maybe boring in building institutions and building institutional practices, bureaucracy in a good sense. And so I think uh, there is still a lot to do in terms of um, uh, statehood with regard to our institutions, especially uh, national uh, national government institutions. And I think since 2014, and this is when I joined the ministry, I joined the ministry day one after Maidan, after the Revolution of Dignity. Back then, I would not even dream of that uh, because it was Yanukovych time and you, you don't even dare dream in entering public service if you are not a uh, son or daughter of someone. Um, so uh, I, I worked there for six years uh, after the Revolution of Dignity and so different ministers until becoming myself one. Um, now, it's for me, it's a little bit hard to assess the effectiveness of the ministry because people who are in the new team are good colleagues and good acquaintances of mine. So I try to give them still a kind of um, an opportunity to... Uh, to show the results and uh, also acknowledge uh, the fact that I think the teams that are now in the governmental, uh, in, in different governmental ministries are actually dealing with the hardest time times ever in our um, independence. You cannot compare anything else uh, to that. And so it's very easy to criticize any minister, including minister of uh, education. But when you have, uh, um, you know, Every 10 school destroyed, uh, half a million of kids abroad, uh, 2 million kids doing online, 1 million kids doing offline, uh, lack of bomb shelters um, and other other challenges, you know, and, and on top of that, uh, no funds because Ukrainian, for instance, this, mm, uh, teacher salaries are basically barely covered by the Ukrainian government. They are paid by the World Bank, for instance, well, partially. So, so there are so many challenges that I would be probably that would not be ethical for myself to anyhow assess their effectiveness. Uh, what I would say is, is that um, what we really need right now is uh, is more coherent and more systemic strategy of recovery of access to education that would be uh, time specific, uh, because. Uh, Based on my own experience, what we can do now in terms of recovery of access to education, rebuilding of schools, getting kids back to learning, it's very different to, in comparison to what we could do last year. For instance, in Chernihiv, this is the northern city where we started working at first. Uh, I remember the city after it was uh, after Russians were ousted from the from the north. The city was a complete ghost, right? People were afraid to go outside. Uh, Twenty seven of out of 34 schools bombed. It was a nightmare. But right now, it's a vibrant city with roughly 85% of kids back to the city, right? Uh, schools are being back uh, in terms of physical recovery. So, uh, And that's just one of the examples that even if the war is ongoing, there are still different phases and stages of what we can do and and and, and how. And I think this is um, this is right now a challenge for the Ukrainian government and the society at large on different levels to uh, to do just that. Because, well, <clears throat> unfortunately, we uh, depend pretty much uh, completely on international on on foreign support especially when it comes to recovery, especially when it comes to huge recovery, like we, like in education. And so we have to have a very clear message and clear strategy um, on that. And I think, unfortunately, this is something that is uh, currently um, lacking. I would uh, agree with Anna, and I would also say that um, uh, working in Ukrainian government right now and uh, Ukrainian ministries is probably one of the hardest jobs in the world at the moment. Changes, uh, challenges are absolutely enormous. Working uh, atmosphere and the subculture uh, which we inherited from the Soviet Union is uh, hugely unhuman and unproductive. And being a civil servant in Ukraine is a very, very, very hard job. I was one uh, for, uh, for a uh, short period of time, and I remember it as the most stressful, very hard time 
um, of my life. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't uh, dare to actually undermine those people even more. There is also a huge problem in Ukrainian civil service generally that many of the people that work there were women as well, and those women uh, evacuated together with their children uh, to other places. So our governmental bodies are uh, depopulated in some times. You just don't have people working in those institutions, and it's extremely hard to employ people in the um, in the uh, in those institutions, in the, those governmental um, institutions, also because of the um, the really unhuman subculture that was with, was partly inherited and pa partly created, honestly speaking, also by our efforts, um, sometimes uh, radical and extreme uh, efforts of the uh, cleansing of cor corruption. Sometimes it, it's a way uh, too um, uh, irrational um, in, certain, um, in certain cases. So that built an environment in which uh, working for the government, for people who are in those institutions is, is very, very hard. Having said that, uh, the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture at the moment doesn't have a, a minister, so you can't uh, really assess that. And I still hope that there will be, um, will be a competent um, gov uh, government man uh, member in in charge of culture in the nearest future. Let's hope for that. Thank you. I'm looking once more or whether there are questions from you. Give me a sign. Don't see it. Uh, then I would have uh, my question. Uh, it's my final question, and probably then I will ask once more last time if you have questions. So, like, the, the last chance is still coming. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, in your professional activity, what are main concerns that you are right now having, main challenges, and what are your main priorities of your institution? What would, would be the main priority of Mestets Kersinal of a safe at uh, for the next period of time you can think about, you can plan? Let me start then. Well, uh, one of the, uh, remember what I've said about evacuation and lack of people, uh, etc. This is also true for other institutions. Um, for us as an institution to perform and to do our job and to serve our societies, we, we really need to have the best professionals that are there. And um, I am happy to, uh, to be a part of a great team. However, um, you need to expand sometimes. You need to get new new people, and that's a problem. Uh, it's uh, one of the problems is that we are um, systematically underfunded, and if you want uh, great people, you still uh, need to pay the, their salaries, even if not uh, not huge. However, they have to be sufficient for people to be able to live. Right, and we operate on the backdrop of many um, many institutions of uh, international uh, technical support and financial support, which is absolutely great to Ukraine. But those institutions need their employees as well, so we're competing with them, and that's uh, that's a hard uh, competition. That there is one uh, one thing. Second thing is that. It's, very, very hard to uh, plan. So we have an inner joke that we do not plan things. We hope for things to happen uh, and work in that direction. Uh, so you have to be um, extremely tolerant to change. You have to accept that things will not go as you wanted them to go. You have to uh, be uh, ready to change your plans, routine, uh, you, to interchange change between divisions, uh, to the uh, such a practice when people from one div division will will um, will uh, kind of replace. Uh, people in uh, other divisions, although it might not be their job descriptions, like forget about job descriptions uh, altogether. You just think about capacities. Who is capable 
to do what. Um, so that's, um, that needs a huge amount of flexibility from the people and people get tired too. You can't be flexible always. And um, give, uh, let me give you a context. Probably the most, uh, the most, um, uh, the uh, vivid picture that I can give you is this May in Kiev, and we were preparing the book arsenal that opened in June. But May was it's May was beautiful in Kiev. You had chestnuts blow, uh, blossoming everywhere, warm and you know full of uh, lilac uh, blossoming everywhere. But we also had uh, missile strikes every individual night during the whole month. So we had 30 day nights of uh, air raid alerts and strikes. So people did not sleep for 30 nights and it was the whole city. Um, then uh, I remember once coming to, uh, to the office in the morning and I see uh, five or six people from the team standing um, uh, under a beautiful blossoming tree having uh, black coffee and exchanging their recollection from the night where, uh, where uh, there was the night when the Patriot system, air defense system, first hit um, the uh, the Skinjal um, ballistic missile, Russian missile, which was thought to be uh, impossible to intercept, and it was intercepted. And that's how you start your day. And then you go on preparing the book arsenal. After the, or afterwards, and there is then you have to apply this strange logic that okay, uh, there are thirty nights of strikes in May, so they will probably run out of missiles for June, so we will probably be able to have our festival, and that's a very very strange thinking, but you kind of learn to think in this uh, way, uh, so that uh, I would say. That uh, on the one hand, it uh, just shows you how how professional, how focused, and uh, how devoted people are, but also shows how they how exhausted they uh, get uh, in some point. And that's probably and this is all on the backdrop of lack of financing. They also have to fundraise like crazy all the time. So um, that just give uh, that gives you more or less the um, the picture in which we operate. And probably a part of your team also joined army because I know, like in our case, uh, we cannot find technical directors anymore because best people who were technical directors are now doing a very important job. They're all working with drones, and uh, we cannot find anybody who could do a little bit more complex multimedia installation because all of the people are doing more important job right now. It's not our case because uh, these are mostly women that work in the uh, um, arsenal, but uh, there are also engineers. They are men. Uh, they, they, they have not been called to the army, but that can happen uh, at any moment, too. Thank you. Yeah, you know, uh, answering your question, I kind of um, like the, the title of this panel, Forms of Presence, because I was thinking, like, while you were talking, that... Uh, Currently in Ukraine, so few things are continuous and they're just basically some forms of presence. There is some form of presence of uh, sleep, right? There is some form of presence of a continuous physical training because you, you might train, 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 and then you have 20 nights in a row of strikes and your body just <laughs> cannot do that. You have some form of presence of educational process because you might have months without strikes, even without air raid sirens. And people are also very stressed when there are no sirens because it means that something bigger is coming. Uh, <clears throat> and if there are no sirens, you kind of have your learning process uh, either online uninterrupted or even offline. Uh, but these are all just uh, forms. And uh, I completely agree with Olesya that one of our challenges is this well, continuous uncertainty with regard to are the instruments that we are offering to the war damaged communities in liberated areas, uh, would they be still helpful in, in a couple of months' time? Just to give you an example, we work a lot in the city of Mokolaev. Uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's a city in the south. The Russians didn't manage to capture it. However, it was heavily shelled for, for a very long time, for roughly nine months until Kherson was liberated. 
Uh, and so what we do, is a, a lot of schools are damaged there. Um, and what's what's important, the water system is damaged. And what we did in, uh, in Mokolai, we did 12 wells and, and 12 water purification systems in schools in order to give access to, because a school cannot reopen if there is no wa- no pure water. Uh, we arranged uh, uh, some rehabilitation of schools. And then, uh, so like the city was preparing to get back offline. And then Russian struck uh, was a Iskandar missile, the Sierra in Chernihiv. And then school was hit with a drone in Sumy. And everyone was like, okay, no one is going back to offline. Everyone will stay online for for further notice, right? So the whole September, now October, Mokolai is doing online. And what we started basically doing even faster would be the bomb shelters that would be completely arranged as learning spaces and not just spaces for um for the for, for the air raid siren uh, time so i think this this challenge of um of our solutions to renew access to education uh that would be fit for purpose fit for time uh this is one of the challenges and then one thing that i uh, i would really like to mention i think uh our common challenge uh including those people who are uh who represent different countries here and those who are listening to us online like a lot of us donate, a lot of you donate, a lot of us donate uh, to various international organizations or the governments donate, right? Like uh, pretty much all the governments donate to UNICEF. And to me, it is really a huge challenge that it's it's a 600 day, uh, 601, I guess, something like uh, we, we stopped counting of the war. And I haven't seen a, a fully fledged strategy of an international organization that that is helping in Ukraine with, with regard to the sector, right? So I have no clue what different international players are planning with regard to recovery of education, for instance. And to me, that is a challenge because uh, I'm puzzled with regard to how long do you foresee your presence in Ukraine? In what form? Because um, distributing backpacks is, is, is nice and easy, but it does not solve an issue. Uh, doing a tent... Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I've, I've just see, I've been to Mukolai uh, two weeks uh, two weeks ago. No, last week. I was there last week. We've we been traveling around the liberated areas where we work, and I saw a lot of these abandoned tents with Save the Children label or UNICEF label. What are they doing still there? Like they are completely abandoned. No one is using them, but nothing is happening with the completely destroyed educational infrastructure. And so to me, this is the question. Okay, guys. Well, okay, I understand that the first shock is gone. The emergency phase uh, is gone only in our minds. We all normalized the war. We all normalized, unfortunately, the damage. But what is our common strategy with regard to recovery? And I think this is a challenge um, for for everyone, Uh, for the national government, for the NGO sector that I currently represent. And I think for these organizations uh, themselves, because it, it, it seems like they are... They are just, um, you know, running from one war or crisis or natural disaster to another. And I think that's that's not really um, sustainable. Thank you, Anna. And you mentioned earlier on that in Suma, as, uh, if I heard you right, 85 kids, uh, like they came back to schools or like it in was Suma, uh, 85 uh, no, that was Chernihiv, uh, and the same thing in Mukulayev, actually. So currently this, both cities, and these are big cities, well, Chernihiv before the big war was 250,000 inhabitants and Mukulayev, slightly more than 400,000. Uh, according to the local uh, authorities' data, roughly 80% of children uh, are there, are back to the city. Uh, and well, and they have to have access to education. And what are your observations now about this coming back rate? Is it still on? Is it falling? Was it some kind of a wave when the people came back and now it stopped? Or don't you have any I observations? I certainly think uh, that was a wave because, uh, well, families are deciding before the academic year, what do they do? Do they stay in, in Germany, Poland, other countries, or do they go back home, right? So uh, there is, of course, this time-related wave. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes, question. I have actually one question. Um, 
So I, firstly, I, ha I have to say I really admire your work. You, what you are really doing now, it's really a big, big job. And thank you for me. I'm also from Ukraine. Thank you very much. And I asked myself, because we spoke about forms of presence, and I thought also about new forms. And you also told that if you rebuild new schools, so rebuild schools, you also try to rethink model and maybe also, uh, also rebuild like some educational model uh, in school. But I also asked myself, is it war time, the new time? Because of course we have to be very flexible. Uh, we, has to, we have to be very, we have also to rethink a lot of uh, stuff. But is war time a right time for innovation and new forms? What do you think? Well, I think uh, that yes. I think we have to preserve as many parts of our normal life as possible, including this strive for doing better uh, than, than we did before. And that with regard to forms of presence, um, I think it also very much depends on the region uh, of Ukraine that we are talking about. And thank you for reminding me. I actually forgot to mention this. Uh, very, very war damaged uh, areas, liberated areas. Uh, they are very, well, you know, they are very different from... Luckily, well, luckily, okay, it's a bad word, but thank God and thank Ukrainian army that not the whole Ukraine, right, is like that. So Lviv, ivano Frankivsk, Transcapesia, they can still have relatively peaceful, uh, more peaceful uh, life. <clears throat> and so these forms of presence are different. And I think like in liberated areas, at least that's what, that's what I see, the this... Um, connection and link uh, and connectivity between culture and education is really a form of presence that has to be strengthened and that is gaining more and more power. As I mentioned before, especially in these areas, there can be no continuity. It's very, very hard to have at least a two months of normal learning process. So what you have to do is basically pop up educational activities, pop up edutainment. And also that's from the kind of soft point of view, uh, from infrastructural point of view, that's somehow um, still unclear to me, but many, many villages and little towns where we work still have intact uh, what we call the houses of culture. These are post-Soviet Soviet buildings, right, that used to serve as community centers uh, for concerts, blah, blah, blah. And we repurpose them into schools or repurpose them into just uh, community spaces that would be fit for, for, for learning, but also for... A local inhabitants to you know getting together uh, in in the afternoon and i think it's also a form of rethinking how we use the obsolete old infrastructure uh in these circumstances but when with regard to uh new kind of concepts and strategies for schools i do believe that believe that we have to do it because uh if there is part of the country that is not so severely damaged infrastructurally they still have relatively you know um more chances to have i can't i can't call it normal living when you have just missiles but still it's uh it happens uh more rarely than than uh artillery uh shelling uh, i think it's critical that we try to preserve those reforms and those steps ahead that we've been doing before before this uh, huge uh, invasion and i think uh, especially when we are talking about complete school rebuilding uh it is critical to also uh, enrich these new walls with new senses. Otherwise, it makes no sense. And this is, for instance, an example that we do in Zhitomer. Zhitomer hasn't been occupied. Um, however, uh, a few sites that Russians hit with the missile were the tank factory and the huge lyceum, scientific lyceum in the city center. Uh, the lyceum will be rebuilt. It's now being planned to be rebuilt with the local funds and Portuguese funds, of the P Portugal government funds. And the city mayor asked us to say that, like, we don't want just walls. We want to have a completely new school that would have new philosophy, new approach, new concept, new program. And what we do for them is completely new tailored curriculum, teacher training programs in order, you know, uh, not to invest uh, 10, 15 million euros into just new beautiful walls. But then the sense would be uh, the same. I think that what this war has to bring us is, is a, you know, a step ahead in many things. Thank you. Last chance for questions. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just thinking about school libraries. 
do kids still have access to newly published books? Because we are here at Buchmesse and I'd love everyone to have an access to cool books there in the school because I think they definitely need to have that. And maybe do you think about any central kind of library for kids so that they can like access it and check out which books are there and what they can read, maybe by topics, by subjects? Well, in, in those uh, schools or learning centers or bomb shelters that we arrange, uh, our obligatory, mandatory budget line is for new books. I have no idea how many hundreds of thousands of, uh, well, min millions of rivnas and hundreds of thousands of euros we spent on, on new books. But for us, it's critical. We, we purchase a lot of uh, new Ukrainian kids literature or historical literature. I think like most of the historical books that were here at the at the shelters we try to procure and provide to schools, but also we do a lot of collaborations with uh, publishing houses like uh, to provide, uh, to collect book, books and, and, uh, and send them to the liberated areas. However, this is, you know, we are an NGO. It's, it's a very, very limited uh, activity. Uh, however, I, I do think, and I do believe that it has to be a central a governmental policy, especially for this eastern and uh, <clears throat> southern regions that have been heavily russified during the previous uh, decades of the Soviet rule, and are still being, you know, predominantly Russian speaking. But what we see among children and also among uh, adults, but they are more sort of conservative by their age, is that they are willing to find this. Ukrainian identity, they are willing to find this link, they are willing to read more uh, about Ukrainian history and, and culture, and uh, we try kind of to provide them that that access to. I, I've been, yeah, as I mentioned, I've been last, last week to Mikulayev and doing this tour against, uh, around the schools, and like, oh my god, I'm entering this, this uh, rehabilitated learning spaces that we did and they have these beautiful books and I really kind of want to get all of them <laughs> to myself because I don't have those <laughs> yeah but I uh, love them for kids so yeah we try to do that but it's still uh, still limited um yeah but there there is an effort and besides that there is also an ongoing initiative from PEN Ukraine they are also collecting books they're co cooperating with many libraries uh, also like uh uh, you can directly donate books to Kherson, for example, to Kherson Library through them. So you could check it out. They also trying to do that. Yeah, yeah, like. It. Thank you so much uh, for uh, being with us on this discussion. It could be called forms of presence. It could be called forms of resilience. It could be called forms of resistance. It's all about that. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Olesa. And uh, have a nice and safe day.